Coming up on Tech News Today, the Times of London's paywall numbers are out. Is the paywall any good? No. We'll tell you why. Also, Chrome OS is coming, and Google's going to pay to squash bugs. It's a bug booty bounty. Coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, November 2nd, 2010. Tech News Today is brought to you by Ford and Voice Activated Sync, featuring true hands-free calling, turn-by-turn directions, 911 assist, and more. Available exclusively on Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury vehicles. For more details, visit SyncMyRidePodcast.com. And by Gazelle, the easy way to sell or recycle the used gadgets lying around your home or office. For a 5% bonus payment for your used gadgets, go to gazelle.com and use the bonus code TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the tech show where we kick around the tech news with our tech feet. And joining us today uh, are two very special guests. They're both <laughs> equally special. Yes, and both <laughs> equally esteemed. But, but we have to start with one, so we'll, we'll go uh, in alphabetical order by first name. Dan Patterson from abcnewsradio.com. Welcome, Dan. It's good to have you back hey, on the show. what's up? Thanks, buddy. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's election day. Uh, which it is. is. Yeah, which is uh, at least here in the United States. It was election day Sunday in Brazil, so it's kind of election week for the United States and Brazil. It's an esteemed week. It is. Uh, also <laughs> joining us from Tech Republic, the editor-in-chief, Mr. Jason Heiner. Good to have you back as well. Thank you, sir. Always a pleasure, and I'm more than happy to be the second most special. No, no. 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 We should share the special. <laughs> there is no, this, okay. is, this is like Little League soccer. Everyone gets a medal. <laughs> I, I like it. I like it. All right. Let's start off with the news that uh, Google-branded Chrome OS Smartbooks should be launching this month. Thomas Ricker from Engadget has this. Uh, it's coming from Digitimes, apparently, though, which uh, they're good with the leaks. Google's operating system will launch later this month, and according to Digitimes, there will be a self-branded Chrome OS notebook manufactured by Inventech. I'm not really familiar with the products of Inventech. Are either one of you guys? No, I don't think they do a whole lot that you know we're familiar with in the in the in the states. So, you know, th this is a this is a challenge for them. Uh, you, you know, I think that the Chrome OS uh, ha has still been something that everyone's wondering why are they doing it. You know, at one point Sergey Brin even said, "Well, yeah, at some point Chrome OS and Android could could merge." You know, because Android is the gorilla in the room here. You know, they they've got Android. Android's been doing well. Uh, so why why do Chrome OS and it's going to be they they talk about it it's the web sort of version of of uh, uh, of their OS and and they want to bring web apps into it as opposed to these kind of native apps that you develop for um, you know a platform like uh, like Android so you know I I'm still not sure it's the right play I I don't know that they shouldn't put all their their momentum behind and all of their energy and resources behind Android. But uh, we'll see. This, this doesn't sound great to me, though. And I, I wonder also uh, what the application play will be. And we, we've heard them say many times that, well, Chrome OS is more optimized for tablets and Android is, is uh, handset and phone exclusive. But then what do you do about the, the branding of the application store? Certainly this is a huge part of their revenue stream or revenue model. Uh, do, you, do you have two separate app stores? That seems like a ridiculous forking of their products. You know, how, do they, how do they merge uh, uh, the, the understandably forked uh, Chrome OS, but the application store with the Chrome uh, or with the Android app store. They're definitely approaching this as an experiment. I think this is Google saying, you know what, we developed this thing, and yeah, do and something Android's the successful <laughs> one, but why not try it? See what happens. Maybe we'll learn something. It looks like they're approaching this a little like the Nexus One. They're right. going to put out a Google branded version. Uh, they're only making sixty to seventy thousand units, according to Digitimes. Although Acer and HP are rumored to be launching Chrome OS gear as early as December. So these are, these are appliances. These are toys. These are going to be sold, I'm guessing, for cheap, without plans, yeah. not like an iPad or a Galaxy Tab, and sold to people who aren't tech enthusiasts, who just are like, oh, that's nifty. I could put that in my kitchen. It's only $100. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know if they'll be able to hit $100, but if they do, that would be good. That would make it um, make it attractive if they could get to ultra-low-cost machines with this, which is possible, but still, when you don't have, I think we're seeing with tablets, when you don't have the integrated st uh, software, hardware, um, you know, chipset stack like Apple does, that these things are getting pretty tough to, to keep um, low price. Um, maybe they can do it with these kind of ARM-based chips that they, you know, they sell for, you know, pennies on the dollar. But um, this thing is, I, I just wonder who they're, they're targeting um, with this uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the markets, not, not so much uh, the demographics like you're talking about, Tom, but also uh, more so the, um, you know, geographic markets. Are they looking at for this more as a developing market kind of product for uh, people that are just getting on uh, the Internet for the first time? Are they targeting more uh, developed market as your kind of like you mentioned, more of your second, third uh, device or, or PC kind of replacement that you, you put in the kitchen? I, I just think that's not a good idea in both places because I think mobile really is, is what's taking over in both of those uh, areas. You've got uh, people using their phones if, as their sort of second device if they're in the kitchen or if they're, um, you know, on the go or somewhere not where, with, where they have a PC. And then in emerging markets, uh, you know, it's all mobile because connectivity, it's, it's much better, uh, much easier and, you know, more effective to do towers than it is to, you know, lay fiber. So I, I just think that in, in all of the, the usage scenarios, I think of this thing, I, I just see mobile as being a better solution. Well, I wonder, um, uh, to add to that real quickly, I wonder if this is actually a, a down market play for Google, a, a market flattening thing. Uh, Tom, what you said a moment ago, uh, that if this is for those who are uh, entry-level tech consumers, uh, I wonder if, if this is the type of thing that can push really cheap, really inexpensive gadgets out to a public that has not yet uh, embraced or adopted like we have on the East and West Coast and really force the consumer expectation down. Yeah, it, it may be. I mean, it, there there are always those kinds of gadgets out there uh, that that sort of extend their fingers into the the lower cost and and the lower interest. Not even not even necessarily savviness or adeptness. Just people are like, you know, I don't, I don't care. I have I don't have time to keep up on all the latest things that that come down the pike. I just want something simple that works. It could it could work for that. By the could way, it, it just broke. Google has settled their Buzz privacy lawsuit. Uh, the search firm will cover the costs of the class action suit against them and agreed to settle, set aside $8.5 million for a privacy education fund to inform users about privacy risks online. That's mm. nice. Yeah, isn't that nice? Right. You have until uh, December 6th to signal whether you would like to opt out of that class if you have ever uh, used Google Buzz. But we will be uh, educated soon by Google, it sounds like. $8.5 million worth of education. Also, some education going on from the United States Supreme Court over violent video games. This is a California law that would punish stores that sell certain content to children. Transcripts are available online, and they are fascinating reading. Uh, the court, if you've never really followed the court, this is normal. The court takes both sides of the argument, right? They, they grill the prosecutors, and they grill the defense. Uh, and that's what went on here. On the one side, they said, how do you tell what's violent? And the... Uh, the state of California could not really come up with a good definition of where the line was. Uh, on the other side of it, they said, so, you, so you, uh, you, know, you don't think that there's any way that the government would have any role in deciding whether these things can be sold or not. Uh, and, and the defense said, well, yeah, that, that's exactly right. And they got burned by that, uh, saying there is plenty of proof children are going into stores and buying these games despite the voluntary rating system, despite the voluntary retailer restraint by some. There's still proof out there and abundance of it. So neither side coming off very well in this first round, it seems like. Well, and, and what's interesting, if you follow, uh, Slate.com has been doing a really great uh, uh, series of, of uh, pieces about this, uh, particularly their political podcast from last week. And uh, don't quote me verbatim on this. This isn't a verbatim quote, but there's something that, that parallels radio in that language and that uh, something similar to contemporary community standards that, of course, in, in broadcast radio is, you know, how do you define what's offensive and, and what's not? And there's language in there that, that uh, harkens back to that. So it's very vague and very difficult to, to parse 
a precise meaning. As you zoom in, it gets more and more difficult. But as you zoom out, I think the, the hope of the court is that, uh, uh, like pornography, we can't tell you what it is, but we know it when we see it. Another interesting uh, exchange was about whether the so-called uh, 12 physical acts uh, that Morazzini of uh, the state of California was using to define whether something is violent enough to be banned or not uh, applied to imaginary characters uh, if, they apply, if they had to be human. And it, it seemed as if uh, the state of California was saying, yes, it has to be human. Uh, so Justice Sotomayor says, if the video producer says, this is not a human being, it's an android computer simulated person then all they have to do is put a little artificial feature on the creature and they could sell the video game and mr morazzini of the state of california said under the act uh yes so <laughs> make all your grand theft autos full of elves and i guess you can sell them to whoever you want <laughs> right. yeah I... I, I i don't think this is going to end up well for the state of california they are they are pushing against both sides but th what you brought up dan the fact that they can't really make a very clear definition of where the line is is what the Supreme Court is looking at and if they can't find that definition I don't I don't think they uphold the law so agreed agreed okay very well <laughs> motion carried <laughs> moving on to the next turn uh, it is the uh, the election in the United States right now and uh, this is probably the most social network oriented election we've had yet don't you think Dan yeah, um, uh, we were talking in the pre-show uh, about, uh, you know, some of the ways that we almost take uh, some of the social web for granted. But if you recall in 2006, at the time, uh, Twitter was, was still uh, SMS-based or, or shifting over to having a website. So it was it had It had a website, Twitter. but yeah, most people tended to use Twitter SMS. I remember at the time I sort of used it in, in a mix, like a 60-40 yep. mix. Yeah, yeah, and and that was actually pre at Reply Day. I think I'm user number twenty five hundred on Twitter, and I remember only using it on my mobile phone in South Dakota of all places. Um, and in two thousand eight, of course, now the the inauguration of President Obama is largely considered the time where the the social web, or at least Twitter, really tipped as it was adopted by most major broadcast and news organizations during the inauguration. We were certainly uh, using it here at ABC News Radio, but uh, again, it wasn't. Uh, mainstream. The social web was not as adopted as it is now. And, and beyond adopted, it's really, the social web has come into maturity and, and uh, mobile devices have also come into maturity. So we see things like Foursquare and Gowalla encouraging uh, users to check in at their polling place and, and you get rewards for doing so. But I think that, that what's really interesting is that, that although we, we in the tech world have used the social web for a long time, you know, we used to call it Web 2.0, uh, the rest of the country is just now using it so we can really have a critical mass uh, and, and really good numbers in terms of, of projections, forecasting, and really understanding how the mainstream how normal everyday Americans use the social web to engage politically. Jason, do you think that, that this will actually encourage people to vote more? Or is it just giving us a, another window so that we can follow madly on Election Day what's going on? Yeah, I don't know that it's going to encourage many people to vote. I noticed when I was at my you know, polling place this morning, as usual, there are very few people in their 20s and 30s there. Um, it was mostly people older than that. Um, but I, I do think that the ways that news organizations and even politicians uh, are using this is much more uh, natural and much more social than in the past. You know, two years ago and, and even before that, a lot of the ways that it was being used was just as a, a real sort of broadcast, promotional, marketing kind of vehicle. Now I see them sort of embracing the sort of socialness of it, uh, of these things, and, and tweeting um, and you know, posting things that are you know relevant. They'll post things behind the scenes. They'll post photos. They'll post things that are are much more natural and interesting, and not sort of the um, you know just blasting out the stuff that everybody's already heard and or heard hours ago. Um, that that you used to see on a lot of the sort of news sites, as well as the um, you know the politicians themselves and their um, you know organizations. So I, this it seems that the social is much much tighter 
are integrated into what they do, and that makes it a lot cooler. Uh, and you're really seeing some real news and information and cool stuff on there now. If you well, want, and Jason, not to uh, not to get too too self pluggy or, or promotional, but but I think the larger. Uh, 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 cultural ramifications of what you just said, the, the loosening up and, and the more conversational aspect of, of news organizations. While I, can, I certainly can't speak for my organization, uh, Sam Donaldson is, is a couple of meters away from here, and we're going to be doing a, a Twitter conversation with him uh, on news radio this afternoon or this evening. And, and I think that you're absolutely right in that it, it really has helped the two-way communication within news organizations so that we can hear and, and talk with not just talk at or talk to. That's often one of the, the main criticisms of uh, major media is that, that it's a one-way conversation. But in the last few years, this has really helped this become a, a two-way discussion. I think one of the other very interesting things about the, the increase of the social web has to do with data. And, and uh, of course, young people are those, uh, like you said, they're, they're rarely out at polling places, although uh, young people are those who have adopted uh, the social web and most polls and, and particularly uh, Nate Silver 538 uh, who comes from the baseball world and sabermetrics actually but but most polls take into account things like uh, uh, different demographical details but what really matters is likely voters and and likely voters are not necessarily those who have been polled on their cell phone because how does polling work on a cell phone? Very, very differently yeah. than, than traditional methods. Well, that's why I like the Iowa electronic markets. I know you're, you're a bit of a fan as, as well, Dan. Uh, Dan set up a uh, bit.ly link because the, the market is the link is so convoluted being an educational institution. If you go to bit.ly slash Iowa electronic market, uh, you can actually take a look. The way these work is people put down money, real money, on the outcome of the election and uh, it, they work in different ways there's one that's for the congressional election market where you can buy either a democratic house democratic senate republican house republican senate or a mix a republican senate democratic house or democratic senate republican house these tend to outperform polls or at least perform closely to polls in their ability to predict what actually happens right now the iowa electronic market uh 85 percent buying a Republican House Democratic Senate, uh, and, and I think that's probably what everyone agrees is, like, is likely to happen. Uh, they should add a fantasy football element to yeah, this. Yeah, they should. Let us draft, you know, politicians. It's game mechanics. Yeah, fantasycongress.com. It actually exists. There you go. Yeah. Hey, hey Dan, before we uh, take a break for a commercial, I know you've got compiled a lot of great links uh, over there at abcnewsradio.com uh, for places to follow what's going on as the returns come in. Uh, tell us about a couple of those. Yeah, it seems like almost every major news organization has an, an election uh, dashboard. And we do have one uh, at uh, abcnews.go.com. And uh, if you go to abcrad.io uh, slash live, you can uh, uh, look at some of the things we've thrown together here at News Radio. But, it, but there are some really cool things going on. Of course, I'm, I'm a big geek for, uh, for Nate Silver and 538. Uh, I, I can't claim to uh, be a statistician, but he is he is accurate more often than not and the way he runs prediction models is very interesting uh you can find that at elections.nytimes.com slash 2010 slash forecasts uh but the huffington post has a fantastic election dashboard and uh, what we've kind of done here is set up a number of screens and monitors so that not only can we watch uh here in the newsroom and uh, i peek my head up over the newsroom wall here and uh, it looks like uh, the tvs all have have uh, uh, broadcast on, but we also have each different dashboard running in the background so we can see how our numbers stack up against other numbers and, and really find the valuable information that exists regardless as to news organization. Huffington Post is simply HuffingtonPost.com slash elections and uh, uh, the ABC one is uh, ABCnews.go.com slash politics. Uh, but there is a uh, um, I don't know if you guys want to put it into the show notes. I can certainly put some links up to uh, a ton of different links from a ton of different news organizations, including Rewrite Web, who's compiled a list of where to actually watch returns online, video returns online uh, throughout the evening. And that's, that's a really fascinating blog post to read. Folks, this episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Ford and Voice Activated Sync. We thank Ford for their support. 
A uh, problem for a lot of us these days while we're driving is we do a lot of other things or we would like to do a lot of other things while we drive and it's not necessarily safe. Uh, you want to make phone calls. You want to play music or podcasts. You want to spend time looking uh, for what we want to listen to before we play them. The trouble is that that takes your eyes off the road and that's not safe. So check out Ford Sync. It's true hands-free calling. You got a Bluetooth phone, you walk in, most phones, it works right away. It gives you turn-by-turn -turn directions, 911 assist, and more. Uh, you make calls over the Bluetooth. You get your text messages read to you. Uh, you can dictate a text message to be sent. Only way you even want to consider sending a text message when you're driving. Uh, you get turn-by-turn -turn directions. If you're ever in an accident and an airbag deploys, Sync automatically calls 911 for you. It is the only way, if you want to use technology while you're driving, uh, that you want to consider doing it is hands-free and Ford and voice activated sync uh, is an excellent way to look at it. Check it out at syncmyridepodcast.com. Uh, it's standard on some Ford Lincoln Mercury models and optional on others. When you get in a car with sync, your mobile phone just plugs right in. You can plug in your iPod or Zoom, say, call Eileen, call, send a text message, do this or that for syncmyridepodcast.com. And we thank Ford for their support. So the uh, London Times, the Times of London, put up a paywall, uh, and they finally announced some real numbers today. They say that visits to their website have fallen by about 87%. They were registering about 21 million unique users a month this year, but the figure has now fallen to 2.7 million. The paper said that in addition to the 100,000 people who had a subscription to read the newspaper in print and therefore get the digital version already... Uh, they got 105,000 people to pay for the online version. Now, the interesting thing about that is th those 105,000 people aren't buying a subscription necessarily. Some of them may just be buying one issue for one pound. So what, uh, after parsing all these numbers, Jason Heiner, what do you, what do you think? Is this, uh, this bode well for print or is, is this as devastating as a lot of people are making it out? Ooh, I, I think it's bad. Um, you know, it's it's commoditized news, and and you really are, anybody's going to have a hard time selling commoditized news, uh, putting it behind a paywall. Um, I, I still think that you know most of these news organizations are in the midst of a, a historic transformation, and um, and they're going to have to completely rethink the way they they do things, and and of course their cost structures, uh, and uh, other if they don't, and if they try to kind of hold on to sort of the old model and see what they can do to fund the old model, you know they're going to fail, and I, unfortunately I think this is an example of it. Even though these guys do great stuff. Uh, and I, I, I just can't see this working out for him. I mean, you know, our Times, the New York Times, is, is going through the same thing. And um, the Wall Street Journal is a little bit different case. You see that one thrown out. But, you know, that's financial information that people, um, you know, have what we call in business a clear ROI, return on investment. You know, you buy that, you buy a subscription there, you know, you get something back or you have the perception of getting something back. For commoditized news like, um, you know, the Times of London does, th there's just going to be a very small number of people who are going to be willing to pay. Dan, well, I think something that's, that's not often discussed when when we in technology talk about paywalls and and business models this is the worst economy since jesus was a sophomore and and exactly like jason said when something becomes commoditized it's hard to monetize in a good economy this is this is unfortunately a very difficult time to be trying a a a business model that could have real impact and real effect on the quality of news and quality journalism that is produced by by the Times and many other organizations. I think this is an abject failure. I mean, when you consider those hundred thousand are not a month; those are hundred thousand since the paper went behind the paywall in what June? I think for it's over four months. Mm -hmm. That's that's not enough for a a paper. The quality and history of the Times, the the yeah. the, the you know the Times New Roman font is named after this paper this is this this paper is huge in the history of journalism uh it should be getting more people coming to its website and and even pro i i think willing to pay for it so they're they're doing something wrong and this is going to eliminate advertiser interest if you have this low of a level of people you're not they're not charging enough to make a go of it i i don't think this works for them yeah, it's turning back the clock. You can't turn back the clock. You know, they, they've got to move forward and think forward and, and not think backward.
Intel is changing its strategy, or at least that's the idea. Intel's Bill Kirkos uh, flagged an announcement by Acronix that the latter company would be making its field programmable Gatorades, their FPGAs, on Intel's 22 nanometer process, which Intel just put into place. Uh, it's a very small deal. Everybody's trying to downplay it, but there's a couple angles on this. One is that Intel's letting another company try out a new capacity to see if there's anything wrong with it. Uh, the other is the idea that Intel may be starting an, a side business where they allow other uh, chip makers access to their fabs so that they can create chips and uh, diversify the business instead of, you know, in, instead of just being the, the company that makes it all themselves. I'm of two minds on this. One, I think it's actually pretty creative thinking on Intel's part to say, hey, look, one of our core competencies is building great facilities where uh, we can make chips and certainly we can rent this space, this you know, world um, class facility to other companies that maybe don't compete directly in some of the markets that we're focused on uh, and, and sort of make um, some additional revenue you know, off of that. So I sort of tip my hat to them for that. But the other part of this that sort of worries me a little is that 22 nanometer, um, <clears throat> as you're getting into this kind of uh, size, you're really talking mobile. These are mobile chips. And this sort of feels like a tentative move um, from Intel's part of like that they're, they, and it sort of relates to other moves that they've been making too. They just feel so tentative in the moves that they're making in mobile. And they need to be seriously putting a, a lot of resources and thought and their best minds and their be all their, you know, top resources against the mobile problem because they haven't figured it out. And, you know, right now we're at, you know, about a million, a billion, I'm sorry, a billion people on the planet that are, you know, com have, uh, are part of computing, you know, 20% of the planet, you know, over the next two decades, you know, that there's the potential for that to get to like 50%. And almost all of it's going to happen in the developing world. And almost all of it's going to happen in mobile. I think latest estimates are like 80% of the next, you know, billion computers, computing devices are going to be mobile. Um, you know, just for the reasons of it's fa it's easier to scale. Um, you don't have to have as you know much uh, other infrastructure. You don't have to have a desk. You don't have to have a, you know an Ethernet cable. All these kinds of things. So I, I just think Intel, if they don't want to be reduced to a niche player over the next couple decades, they need to put everything into mobile. And this just doesn't feel like they're doing it. Europe's throwing some money into mobile. They they're <laughs> investing uh, 22 million euros into Symbian. Uh, which a lot of people think is a dying operating system. It's, it's still hugely used. It's, very, it's widely popular, uh, but it's been decreasing. And, and even Nokia is hedging its bets. And Nokia is sort of the, the big popularizer of, of Symbian. But they've made the Symbian Foundation an open source foundation as a way to maybe revive it. Now Europe says we don't want it to fail. It's, it's almost like they're nationalizing an operating system. Well, I think, uh, you know, we mentioned during the, uh, the pre-show um this this can and maybe we can find parallels here in in the states between what's happening with this and potentially with companies like google or facebook this is really a platform that is so insinuated in the way a government does business that uh the government has decided to throw a lot of money at it they've got this a is state. Not a, exactly yeah. an os it's a platform yeah. and it's a platform that's apparently essential for the eu to to run Boy, I just can't, uh, you know, Symbian is uh, just uh, from a technical and usability standpoint, um, man, it is not good. And, it, and, and Symbian 3, which there was high hopes for, would really make a big step forward. Um, it's not there. I mean, it, it is not. It, it's really about the same level of kind of what BlackBerry is, you know, what Research in Motion has tried to create. They tried to take a big step forward, and, and it really just it is not on par with, um, you know, with like, Android, iPhone, uh, you know, iOS and WebOS. And so, uh, I, you know, Europe wants Symbian to succeed. It's very popular OS in Europe. They're trying to, to do, you know, their bit for it. But this just feels like a waste of taxpayer money to me. I, I, I just think that, go, you know, governments have no business um, <laughs> in the platform game. And, and, um, and I just I think this is a sort of a really bad development. Before we hit the news fuse, I want to mention uh, something Michael Dell said. Uh, Jason, you, you, brought, you brought this up. Dell CEO Michael Dell was in Hong Kong and suggested at, a, at the event uh, that they're finding Microsoft's smartphone platform easier to develop for than Android. And he also announced a, a bunch of tablet offerings 
uh, that Dell's going to come out with. Is this Dell choosing sides or just trying to get somebody to pay attention to him? Ooh, you know, it's interesting that now um, on the uh, on, on Twit on Sunday, Loic said something similar um, about, you know, the uh, CEO of Seismic. He said that his developers found because they'd already developed a uh, uh, Silverlight app uh, for using Microsoft's platform, that when they went to develop the Windows Phone 7 app, which they did, um, that it was a lot faster than, I believe he said, Android or, uh, or iPhone. Um, so this isn't sort of an unprecedented remark, but it's pretty interesting because uh, it, to me, in light of the product that they did create, the Dell Streak, which used Android 1.6, it was a decent um, hardware product, but the software was awful. And so my take on this is Michael Dell saying, look, we're looking to somebody else to help us with the software because we, you know, we, we know that we kind of screwed up Android when we first tried it and, and it's, it was a bit of a train wreck. And so he's looking for me reading between the lines is him saying that they're looking, maybe Microsoft can help them and do a better job than what they found when they went with Android. Um, so that's an interesting uh, equation. And certainly he also said in the same uh, remarks, same set of remarks, that, that they're planning to do a whole host of tablets. So I took that as we're going to do lots of different sizes, we're going to experiment with different OSs, maybe Android, maybe Windows um, 7, maybe Windows Phone 7 if they put that in tablet, maybe even like a Chrome OS. Microsoft certainly has it in their interest too to make things easy for people. They're 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 a, a lot of people consider them a leg behind in this race. So I, I would yeah. they're far from count them out though. They they got the operating system out to fairly good reviews in time for the holiday season. Uh, so the the battle is on and getting Dell in your corner not a bad thing. They're old they're old pals. Dell and Microsoft definitely. definitely. Want to uh, thank Gazelle for their sponsorship of Tech News today. Uh, if you've got old gadgets laying around, I know I do because I buy way too many of them, and then I have them laying around, uh, you might want to figure out what to do with them, and Gazelle is one of the easiest ways. I love using Gazelle. I used it uh, to sell my old iPhone. I've used it to sell a couple other old gadgets I've had lying around, an old media streaming tank, for instance, the Popcorn Hour box. Uh, all you do is you go onto Gazelle, you type in your, your device, and you say, this is the condition it's in, these are the wires I have. They give you an estimate of how much they can pay for it. Uh, and you say, great, you either print up the label right then and send it into them, and then they'll send you a check, or they can even deposit it at PayPal or give you an Amazon gift card or something like that. Or you can actually have them send the box. If you're, that, if you're lazy like me, they'll send you the box with the label. You don't have to do anything. You don't even have to find a box. Then you just pack it up, mail it away. They send you your money. If it's not worth anything, which, you know, some gadgets, you hold on to them so long, they're just obsolete, they'll take it anyway and they'll recycle it for you. And you can you can investigate them, find out what they do with the recycling. They're a responsible recycler. So go to gazelle.com, check it out. Uh, you'll get a 5% bonus when you use the code TNT. So whatever price they quote you, add 5%. Just for listening to Tech News today. So check it out if you got some gadgets to sell. Clean out your closet, clean out your basement. Go to gazelle.com and use the code TNT. Time now for the news views. Ooh, <laughs> the balloon popped. <laughs> We're sort of expecting an announcement from Samsung next week about the Samsung Continuum smartphone, but in gadget reports, Verizon may have spilled the beans a little early. Uh, the phone showed up on Verizon's holiday website with only a coming soon label on it. Previous leaks have pointed to a November 11th release for that dual display phone. Uh, current TV will air a new TV series where the audience will create the plot. Bar Karma, scheduled to debut in the first quarter of 2011, was created by game developer Will Wright of Sims fame. Bar Karma's production model was the audience has the audience submit plots, discuss, and possibly merge storylines, then vote on the finalized proposal, which is then produced. It's like choose your own adventure writ large. Nice. I like it. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> Bounties for booty uh, or for bugs. For booty bounty bugs. Uh, yeah. Google has been paying bounties <laughs> for bugs found in the Google Chrome browser. So it's decided to experiment with bug bounties for almost everything it does. If you uncover any, quote unquote, any serious bug which directly affects the confidentiality or integrity of user data, you may get uh, from $500 to uh 
$3,000, over $3,000. Uh, denial of service attacks and social engineering are not eligible for an uh, reward. You're not also not eligible if you're from North Korea or any of the axis of evil <laughs> countries. <laughs> Microsoft is under assault. After its upgrade of the Xbox dashboard, indie games were moved into an obscure tab called Specialty Shops, and developers are not happy. Uh, they also no longer appear in the A to Z listing of titles, making it hard to browse and purchase indie games. That, combined with the usual launch bugs that any software update has, uh, have led to an internet-sized bundle of rage out there. So if you haven't upgraded your Xbox, maybe hold off see if they come up with another version shortly. <laughs> is Microsoft's Hotmail giving up or cleverly making a play to control other forms of email? Microsoft said yesterday that it was rolling out tech that lets users add accounts from other webmail services, including Yahoo and Gmail. The functional uh, functionality was borrowed from Outlook, which can already do such amazing pop mail accessibility kinds of things. Amazon's Kindle offers access to banned websites in China until about five seconds ago. Yeah, we're still waiting <laughs> for this one to be uh, to to be proved already solved. But yeah, I guess people are twittering like crazy from their Kindles in China. Uh, yesterday, we mentioned that Turkey had lifted the ban on YouTube over the weekend, and after a critical uh, video, uh, or, or, I'm sorry, a video critical of Turkey's founder Ataturk had been removed due to a copyright claim, Google now says it has reinstated the video because they found it did not violate copyrights. Uh, the head of Turkey's telecommunications transmission directorate said he would meet with Google, but the ban may be put back into place. So Turkish users, enjoy your YouTube now while ye may. Gather ye videos while ye may. All right, let's finish up with uh, Wired UK's uh, report that a prototype for an electric vehicle code name Irby uh, had its entire body made from a 3D printer. This is a uh, combination of Stratasys and Core Ecologic. They've partnered to create the electric liquid fuel hybrid, uh, which can deliver more than 200 miles per gallon on the motorway and 100 miles per gallon in the city. That's uh, 100 uh, motorway is highway in, in American. The two passenger hybrid aims to be fuel efficient, easy to repair, safe to drive, and I guess inexpensive to own because you can just print out new parts. Nice. So can we officially say that um, printers are the replicators of the future? Well, as soon yes. as, yeah, once we get those uh, printers that can print themselves going strong. That's right. That's right. Yes. It's all like over. That. And we'll be terrified. There is, uh, if you're interested in 3D printing, uh, you should check out uh, MakerBot. Brie Pettis, a uh, uh, New York uh, techie, uh, has been doing this for quite a while and doing it really, really well. The, the stuff that, that can be done with a 3D printer, if you haven't seen it, Check out some of the uh, the examples because uh, uh, Bree can maybe he can make a car. Uh, but the the MakerBot is your own 3D printer. You can buy this, have this in your home, and you know print mini cars at home. Yeah, and open source. You know a lot of the the uh, diagrams and and you know how do I know what to print and how to print it? A lot of that stuff is open source. It's free and it's online. Awesome. Quick, quick look at the calendar. Uh, German Street View goes live today with enhanced privacy. That's today, November 2nd. So uh, lots of blurry houses on the uh, Google Street View in Germany. Uh, Fedora 14 has been released and reviewed. It is not for wimps, says Slashdot. So if, uh, if you're into the Linux, you might want to check that out. And the International Space Station marks 10 years of continuous habitation. Congratulations, International Space Station. We know you'll end up being a hotel soon for Virgin Galactic. But for now... You're still a viable place for space research. I can't believe that it's already been 10 years. It kind of blew me away when I read that this Yeah, morning. it's pretty crazy. Totally. Huh? Yeah. yeah. On to the voicemails. Got one mailed in to us uh, by someone who wishes to remain mostly anonymous. But he has some inside info. TNT crew, Captain Obvious here. I was calling in reference to the story you'd run on Monday about the ad company that had been sued due to the copyright infringements of one of their affiliates. You'd also pondered what this may mean to another large ad company. I can tell you that this ad company had the good sense to change their affiliate agreement. They now have indemnified themselves from such actions. And remember, kids, if you're not a twit, you're not sh <laughs> Okay. That's, that's Remember one, that. one way of bleeping yourself. <laughs> that's a long sensor bleep. So but yeah, it works. Yes, but will Google's indemnity hold up in court? That that's that nobody want they don't want this company that's doing the suing, they they only want to go after small fry. Yeah. The company being the MPAA. 
they, they don't want to take on Google. That's my thought on that. On to the emails, TNT at twit.tv. David in Birmingham, Alabama says, any chance you could come up with a better way to refer to WiMAX other than 4G? As we all know, it's not 4G. It's just misleading marketing. Semi-informed users will be confused when they listen to tech shows like this one if the experts keep confirming the lie. Just a thought. Now, what David is referring to here, guys, is uh, 4G is a technical term that is certified by a standards organization, and neither WiMAX nor LTE have actually received that certification yet. So it's technically not 4G. And the WiMAX, yeah. the WiMAX that we have now is not the kind that will eventually become 4G. So is, is this important? To, to make clear? Actually, WiMAX is 4G. I, I, I think it's still fair to call WiMAX 4G. It's not as fast as LTE is, and I, I, I suspect that that's what, the, um, that's what David is, is getting at. Uh, and, and that's fair, but that's, I, I think, in all the advertisements and all of the information you see about WiMAX and LTE, it's, you know, you can figure that out. And I think people are smart enough to make the, the distinction. Um, but it is 4G, both LTE uh, both LTE and WiMAX are based on a technology called OFDM, which is a uh, you know a standard that lets um, that lets these um, you know that lets the networks uh, act like data networks. You know, right now, three G networks are essentially voice networks that we're shoving a bunch of data down, and so that's why. Um, AT&T can't solve this uh, problem it has with the iPhone very easily because it's still shoving a lot of data down a voice network. And 4G is our best hope because 4G actually um, handles these networks natively like data networks. They can, um, you know, I won't go into all of the, the, the technical details of it, but in that sense, it's very much fair to call WiMAX uh, a, a 4G network. Um, LTE is a 4G network, and both of them have um, iterations that will make them faster and more effective. Um, and those sort of protocol upgrades and, and different standards, you know, are in place. You know, the next ones are going to be rolled out in a few years, uh, just as soon as these, you know, current ones um, get deployed. So uh, I don't know if that helps. Well, and I think it's also very easy to to cast aspersions, and, and we don't know anything about the marketing process that went into this, but although marketing can be used for a lot of cynical reasons, it can also be used to help clarify, and, and you know, this may be the case where the average, the typical consumer is sitting there thinking, I, I don't know these technical specifications, I, I just know which one was and which one's coming out. Yeah, I... I, yeah. I, I agree with David that, you know, while 4, 4G is a technical term and WiMAX and LTE have not yet been certified, I think you confuse the consumer more by constantly making that admonition because then they're like, well, if it's not 4G, what is it? Or if you just say super fast WiMAX or LTE, maybe you just leave out the question. What bothers me more is when T-Mobile calls their HSDPA 4G, and that is yeah. definitely not 4G. It's very fast, but it's not 4G. It's uh, three and a half G. Yeah. I mean, it <laughs> gets is, silly, right? Yeah. Which is a perfect name for it because it's really just an enhanced 3G network. Um, but again, it's still shoving data down a voice network. Yeah. And you're only going to get so you're only going to get so far doing that. All right. That is it for today. Thank you guys uh, for being on the show. Dan Patterson, uh, let people know where they can find the stuff that you do online and, and follow uh, all the great post-election stuff that you'll be doing. Forget the election is going to be over yeah. by the time a lot of people hear the show. Uh, yeah, well, uh, tonight, if you're watching live, it's uh, abcrad.io slash live. We do have a development site, abcnewsradioonline.com. But uh, you can follow me on Twitter, at Dan Patterson. And Jason Heiner, uh, if people want to get more schooled in the 4G or anything else, uh, I know Tech Republic is a great resource. Let people know where is best to find you. Yes, so um, my blog, Tech Sanity Check, you can find at heiner.techrepublic.com. Um, and you can find me on Twitter. It's just Jason Heiner. Thank you guys both uh, for joining us, uh, and thank you all for watching or listening. You can find us at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us TNT at twit.tv or give us a call, 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll talk to you tomorrow.